Conclusion. Does the platforming of extreme right actors contribute to the spread and normalization of extreme right views? And if so, how? Using two large survey experiments based on real-life interviews with extreme right political activists in Australia and the UK, we consistently find that giving a platform, no matter the type or style, to an extreme right activist leads to a change in perceived descriptive norms. Our study also suggests that uncritical interviewing leads individuals to agree with the statements made by the actor. Our findings on belief accuracy is consistent with a mechanism suggesting that people become persuaded of the accuracy of these views if they go unchallenged. However, the type of platform on which the extreme right actor diffuses his ideas does not appear to matter per se. Being exposed to an extreme right interview on a traditional mainstream TV channels or on the online platform YouTube has the same effect on attitudes and norms. Drawing on the UK experiment, we also show the relevance of a journalist's critical stance towards the actor and his statements. Individuals are more likely to agree with extreme right statements and think that others agree with them if the actor's extreme and false claims are not challenged by the journalist. Having a journalist challenge the actor's ideas counteracts the attitudinal effects that we observe in the unchallenged interview and has a large negative effect on how accurate people rate his statements. However, we find zero evidence that adverse interviewing makes people less likely to agree with extreme right statements compared to the placebo group. This is an important finding, which speaks directly to the popular claim that critical exposure damages extreme right ideas. It seems to have a negative impact on the actor, as respondents exposed to the adverse interview rate him as less credible. However, it does not appear to defeat extreme right ideas, only fight them to a draw. Moreover, while adverse interviewing attenuates the normalization of extreme right views in society, these normalization effects do not entirely disappear, but appear to materialize at a lower rate. Platforming extreme right actors hence leads to a smaller change in descriptive norms, which cannot entirely be mitigated by adverse interviewing. Finally, we find that exposure is not costless for extreme right actors, at least not in all contexts. While their name recognition increases overall, the image of the extreme right activist is consistently tarnished in the British experiment, with negative ratings increasing more than positive ratings after exposure. This is not the case in the Australian experiment, where both positive and negative ratings increase in tandem. This media platforming and the normalization of extreme right views. Diane Bolit Florian Foos. A. B. Stract. As far right views become increasingly socially acceptable, the conditions under which democratic institutions, including the media, contribute to this normalization process, and how journalists can counter it, remain unclear. Drawing on two pre-registered, placebo-controlled survey experiments that use the real-world audio of interviews with extreme right activists in Australia and the UK, we test if media platforming fuels agreement with extreme right views. We find that exposure to uncritical interviews on TV channels like Sky News or on online platforms like YouTube increases agreement with extreme right statements and perceptions that a larger share of the population shares these views. Interviewer strategy matters, but even critical interviewing does not appear to negatively affect support for extreme right statements versus the placebo, while interviewers who challenge the accuracy of false statements tarnish the actor's image and mitigate effects on descriptive norm perceptions, the latter still materialize at a lower rate. Introduction The far right's growing electoral success has been accompanied by the mainstreaming and normalization of their actors and ideas. While the normalization of populist radical right parties has been ongoing for decades, the Overton window is currently pushed further to the right. Extreme right activists, who openly advocate for violence and operate outside the democratic constitutional consensus, are increasingly receiving exposure online and on mainstream media platforms. Some of them push ideas related to white supremacy and conspiracy theories such as the Great Replacement Theory. The entry of far-right actors into mainstream politics poses important dilemmas for democratic organizations and institutions, 
such as mainstream parties and media outlets? Should they engage with far-right actors or avoid providing exposure to their ideas? While there is empirical evidence that accommodating strategies by mainstream political parties contribute to the mainstreaming of the far-right, there is much less theory and evidence about the role that the media, both traditional media, e.g., TV channels and newspaper, and online media platforms, play in spreading and normalizing extreme ideas. With the ownership of many media outlets concentrated in the hands of wealthy conservative entrepreneurs one, extreme right actors are increasingly given a platform to air their controversial views. Conservative media platforms, e.g., Fox News, GB News, showcase extreme actors, while mainstream networks, e.g., CNN and the BBC, claim to invite them to challenge and scrutinize their extreme viewpoints. This includes not only far-right politicians such as Marine Le Pen or Donald Trump, but also increasingly more extreme fringe actors with no democratic legit. Mackey, who are given a platform to comment on event. Similar extreme content is also freely broadcast on the internet and popularized on online platforms such as YouTube, reaching millions of views. Research on social media reveals that deplatforming extreme right activists such as after the U.S. Capitol storming on January 6, leads to a reduction of exposure, but little is known about the attitudinal effects of platforming such actors in the first place. While studies show a correlation between social media use and anti-Muslim attitudes, the specific mechanism is unknown. We contribute to the growing literature on the mainstreaming and normalization of the far right by exploring a specific mechanism through which exposure to far right ideas happens in everyday life media interviews that are broadcast on TV channels and on online platforms. While research has explored the impact of TV networks like Fox News and tabloids like the British Sun on right-wing attitudes, political scientists have only recently started to investigate how media channels disseminate right-wing views, for instance via selective partisan media exposure. We also contribute to the growing literature that looks at the effects of media portrayal of immigrants and refugees on political attitudes. We show that media exposure to interviews with extreme right actors and exposure to their anti-immigration views, on either TV or online channels, leads to higher agreement with extreme right statements and beliefs about their viability in the population. Two going forward we use the term extreme right instead of radical right since the interviewed actors refer to claims that are opposed to aspects of liberal democracies, like minority rights, and legitimize anti-democratic attitudes and the use of violence to pursue the actor's ideological aims. To do that, we draw on two distinct, but similar, real-life interviews with extreme right activists that were broadcast on Sky News in Australia and the United Kingdom, UK. Relying on a series of carefully designed audio experiments based on these real-life interviews, we calm down. Bein increased realism with control over the treatments that study participants are exposed to, and the ability to debrief participants after exposure. Using factorial designs, we vary whether participants listen to the audio of interviews, or to neutral content, a weather report. The second experimental factor varies whether the platform which broadcasts the interview forecast is a traditional mainstream TV channel, e.g. Sky News, 3 or an online platform, e.g. YouTube. We find consistent evidence in line with pre-registered expectations across both countries. Unchallenged interviews with extreme right actors do not lead to rejection, but rather fuel extreme right attitudes and foster the belief that a larger share of the public support the extreme right actor statements. The media strategy adopted by the journalist appears crucial, as uncritical platforming spreads and normalizes extreme right views. When we randomly assign the interviewer to robustly challenge the extreme right actor in the British interview, the reputation of the actor decreases and effects on attitudes subside. Nevertheless, even critical interviews do not lead participants to move away from the actor's statements. Moreover, participants continue to update their beliefs about the viability of these views, albeit at a lower rate. Contrary to our pre-registered expectation, our study also shows that exposure to extreme right actors on the online platform YouTube has a similar effect on attitudes and norms as platforming extreme right actors on the traditional mainstream TV channel Sky News.
This effect is observed in both Australia, where Sky News has a slightly more conservative tilt, and in the UK, where it does not. Therefore, our results suggest that radicalization through platforming is driven by increased exposure to extreme right actors and their views rather than any added legitimacy conveyed by mainstream TV channels over online streaming platforms. Beyond its theoretical and empirical contributions, this paper has policy implications with regards to the platforming of extreme right actors on various media outlets. Across two different contexts, in well-powered experiments, exposing people to extreme right actors' views did not lead to a decrease in public support for those views. It consistently led people to believe that a larger share of the population agreed with such views. Amidst rampant consumption of extremist content on social media and its rise on traditional media, these findings have significant implications for researchers, politicians, and journalists alike. Theory. The role of the media in the normalization of extreme right views and actors. The role of the media has often been mentioned in relation to the growing presence of extreme right actors and ideas in mainstream political discourse. Giving a platform to an extreme right actor has become more commonplace, making extreme right discourse more widespread and available to audiences. The effect of the media on the radicalization of public opinion remains, however, theoretically unclear. It is commonly agreed that media attention matters in increasing citizens' interest in a given topic. Quasi-experiments, which have identified whether media outlets sway citizens' opinions and if so, in which direction, often treat media, non, exposure as a black box. Survey experiments that identify the effects of exposure to different arguments find that individuals update their attitudes in the direction of the argument. Moreover, experiments that vary whether individuals are exposed to one-sided or two-sided frames show that one-sided frames are more effective at swaying public opinion, while two-sided frames, when they are equally strong, are likely to cancel each other out. Yet, one may wonder whether these findings apply equally to all types of messages and for the messengers, or if there is heterogeneity in how individuals respond based on the type of message and messenger that they encounter. A majority of people may be willing to reject extreme right arguments based on their political predispositions. In that sense, when individuals are exposed to extreme right content, those who are sympathetic to extreme right views, i.e., authoritarian individuals, would be even more supportive of such views whereas those who normally reject them, i.e. liberal individuals, would oppose these views even more. This directly relates to what scholars call the backlash thesis which posits that, when individuals are exposed to counterattitudinal evidence, their pre-existing opinions and beliefs are not challenged, but strengthened. Despite its theoretical relevance, the backlash hypothesis has lately received little empirical support, even when strong partisan cues are present. Another argument for why individuals might reject extreme right messages is that there still exist strong social norms that make such views undesirable. Social norms are shared standards of acceptable behavior which individuals learn over time and in a dynamic fashion. However, such norms have been eroding quickly in recent years. Key events such as Trump's 2016 victory in the U.S. presidential election or the entry of extreme right legislators into parliament have changed social norms by signaling that radical right views have become normatively desirable in society. Once extreme right actors entered the White House or a national parliament, social norms have moved in the direction of favoring these extreme right views and actors. Extreme right attitudes and actors which used to be socially sanctioned as norm defiers stigmatized, are now more socially accepted. Hence, individuals might perceive extreme right views as new social norms when the latter are accompanied by a strong signal like the platforming of an actor on media channels. Indeed, media platforming may be directly related to the ongoing normalization of extreme right views. The parliamentary entry of extreme right actors is, for instance, likely both a function and a cause of increased media coverage, especially since gaining more seats leads to increased media coverage, as well as more frequent and better access to public broadcasters. Thus, we expect that media platforming further normalizes extreme right views in society, sending a signal that more citizens than assumed subscribe to these views. 
Furthermore, media coverage may not only provide a stage from which to spread and normalize extreme right views, but it may also increase the legitimacy of extreme right actors by portraying what appears to be politically viable and respectable actors. Through platforming, the media confer legitimacy and authority to political newcomers and dispel voter doubts about their electoral viability. Since extreme right actors are usually marginalized in the political game, offering them a voice gives them the impression that they have a mass following and that they are the voice of the people. Media coverage can also make up for their organizational deficiencies and financial shortages by helping them become known, thus helping leaders of small organizations. Mainstreaming extreme right discourse is a political resource that can lift marginalized actors from obscurity and push them into the political mainstream. That is why the media can be seen as playing a role in the process of spreading and normalizing extreme right views, as well as contributing to the increased respectability of extreme right actors. Based on these theoretical considerations, we pre-registered the following hypotheses on OSF. Persuasion and normalization hypothesis. Subjects who are exposed to an extreme right actor's interview are more likely to a. agree with the views expressed in the interview, b. perceive that the rest of the population will agree with these views, and c. perceive that the actor is more respectable. The moderating role of platform type and journalist media strategy. We also examine two conditions under which exposure to an extreme right interview can further amplify those attitudinal and normalization effects the type of platform and the media strategies adopted by the journalists. First, extreme right arguments can receive more approval if they are conveyed on a platform which has a credible reputation. Studies have highlighted the importance that media reputations play in public opinion. Trustworthy outlets with well-established reputations and high popularity are more likely to positively influence opinion than outlets viewed as non-mainstream. While issue frames from an untrustworthy news source have been shown to be ineffective, the same frames that are shared by a trustworthy source can affect public opinion. We define a credible platform as a traditional media outlet that is known to the public and can reach a large audience, e.g. Sky News, and distinguish it to an online platform that can be unknown to people, e.g. a YouTube channel. While the public has a good sense of the media's overall trustworthiness of well-known traditional outlets such as CNN or Fox News in the US or Sky News in Australia and the UK, our case studies, it is more difficult to assess the credibility of online outlets given the wide array of options in the digital media landscape. The number of online options individuals can encounter far exceeds the number of sources they are aware of, making it impossible for them to discern which online option is credible. This, of course, does not mean that all online platforms are not credible, but that online platforms do not have clear public reputations. An interview presented on a traditional media platform would thus be assigned more credibility compared to one featured on an online platform. We therefore pre-registered the following hypothesis. Platform type hypothesis. Subjects are more likely to a. Increase support. f. Or the views expressed in the interview b. Perceive that a larger proportion of the population shares the views expressed in the interview and c. Perceive the extreme right actor as respectable if the interview is broadcast by a mainstream platform compared to a non-mainstream platform. Moreover, the media strategies adopted by journalists could further impact the support and normalization of extreme right views and actors. The question of whether it is most effective to ignore, accommodate, or challenge the far right is one that political scientists have been investigating since the far right's emergence on the political scene. Journalists can choose between a variety of strategies when it comes to dealing with extreme right actors, ranging from demarcation to accommodation and confrontation. First, journalists can opt to disengage with the actor by refusing to platform them, which is a way to isolate them. This demarcation strategy has become rare over the past two decades as there are few cases where far-right actors are completely ignored. The second strategy involves accommodating extreme right actors by offering them a platform to spread their views without directly engaging with them. The journalist gives the extreme right actors an implicit endorsement by making issues that are typically pushed by such actors more visible, e.g. immigration, nationalism, crime, or by incorporating some of their rhetoric in their news coverage, e.g. by focusing on the silent majority. 
This accommodative strategy is likely to amplify the persuasion and normalization effects of these views. By contrast, the journalist can adopt a confrontational strategy by being critical towards the extreme right actor. This demarcation strategy means that the journalist can point to the inaccuracy of the statements made and or by raising normative concerns, e.g. stressing that the extreme right actor is violating the freedom of religion by adopting anti-Islam positions. We may therefore assume that a journalist who challenges an extreme right actor would undermine the credibility of the actor's views and image. Discrediting extreme right actors' statements and image could weaken persuasion and normalization effects on the public, especially since fact-checking is known to reliably improve factual belief accuracy. We therefore pre-registered the following hypothesis. Media strategy hypothesis. Subjects are more likely to a. Increase. Support for the views expressed in the interview, b. Perceive that a larger proportion of the population shares the views expressed in the interview and c. Perceive the extreme right actor as respectable if the journalist does not challenge the extreme right actor. Research design. Strategies to identify the causal effects of media exposure on political outcomes include field experimental and quasi-experimental designs. Randomized survey experiments have been used to test mechanisms of media influence such as priming and framing. Survey experiments have the advantage of increasing the control that researchers can exercise over exposure to specific messages. While some of these experiments use student or self-selected samples, others use population-based samples. Our study stands in the latter tradition, but increases environmental and external validity by a exploiting two similar real-life interviews with two extreme right political actors and b, conducting two large population-based survey experiments on representative samples of the Australian and British populations. Case studies. In this study, we rely on two separate interviews with extreme right actors that were broadcast on Sky News Australia and Sky News UK in 2018, when both channels were part of Rupert Murdoch's media empire. Fielding the same experiment in two countries allows us to address questions of external validity by using two countries with similar extreme right actors, TV channels, and treatment conditions. At the same time, these two countries have relatively different shares of conservative media. Although Murdoch's News Corp empire exists in both countries, it is even more prevalent in Australia than in the UK. Murdoch built his media corporation in Australia and owns 65% of the country's print media, five popular radio programs and a large online news and social media base. By contrast, Murdoch owns 32.2% of the UK's newspaper, radio stations and television channels. As a result, Sky News Australia is slightly more conservative than Sky News UK, and this is perceived by the respondents in our experiments since respondents perceive Sky News UK to be more mainstream than Sky News Australia, 3.37 vs 4 on a 1 to 5 scale. The Australian Interview On August 4, 2018, Sky News Australia aired a 10-minute interview with the former United Patriots front leader, the extreme right activist, Blair Cottrell. He advocated in favour of both skills-based and culture-based migration where Australia should not accept immigrants who were too culturally dissimilar to Australia. Cottrell also associated the rise of criminality with an increase of African gangs. He finally promoted his Lad Society, a men-only social club involving regular meetings, and encouraged male viewers to join him. Within hours of the interview going on air and being shared on various Sky News social media platforms, the channel removed the interview from its repeat time slots and online platforms. The broadcast also prompted the interviewer to resign from Sky News, as he adopted an accommodating media approach and refrained from challenging Cottrell's claims. This led to a public apology from the channel. The segments that are used in the Australian experiment include Cottrell's views on skilled and race-based immigration, his association of criminality with African gangs and his promotion of his political organisation, the Lads Society. The British Interview On September 27, 2018, Sky News UK broadcast segments of an interview with the former co-founder and leader of the English Defence League, Tommy Robinson. 
The extreme right activist spoke after being released from prison for being found guilty of contempt of court in May 2017 for trying to film and expressing views about suspects in a sexual grooming case in Canterbury. During the one-hour interview Robinson also shared his views on typical extreme right themes, Islam, immigration, and terrorism. He notably praised the temporary halt of the construction of mosques and advocated for the introduction of a Trump-style travel ban to restrict the number of refugees from failed states because he associated refugees with terrorist attacks. Robinson claimed that less people will be murdered and less girls would be raped if a travel ban would be introduced. These segments are comparable to the extreme right claims Blair Cottrell made during his interview. However, unlike the Australian experiment, Robinson was challenged by the journalist a few times. The journalist pointed towards normative concerns for violating basic principles of democracy, but also raised the inaccuracy of Robinson's claims. He not only told Robinson that temporarily stopping the construction of mosques is a violation of people's freedom of religion, of worship, but he also questioned Robinson multiple times about the credibility of his sources on terrorism and Islam. For instance, the journalist asked Robinson where is your source for that, after Robinson wrongfully claimed that the majority of rapes are committed by immigrants. The segments used in the British experiment include Robinson's views on the building of mosques, a Trump-style travel ban, as well as him associating terrorist attacks and rape with refugees. The Australian and British interviews slightly differ in their content, the topics and the outgroup that is targeted by the extreme right activist is not the same as Cottrell targets black Africans, while Robinson targets Muslims and refugees. The topics discussed pertain to the extreme right discourse in each country. Both the comprehensive critical version of the Sky News interview with Robinson and a version that excludes the interviewer's challenges are used in the experiment to closely resemble the interview style that was used in the Cottrell interview on Sky News Australia. The full transcripts of the interviews and weather reports in Australia and the UK are available in Appendix Section D Experimental Design. In our experiments, we use the audio recording of these two interviews. One of the main reasons for this choice is that the quality of the videos uploaded on YouTube is not very high. Relying solely on the audio recording allows us to direct respondents' focus towards the spoken content and the effect of the explicitly announced media platform, eliminating any potential distractions arising from visual cues of the extreme right actors and interviewers. In order to minimize potential harms to participants from exposure to the interviews and from any questionable statements made during the interviews, we debrief them in full directly after outcome data collection. While this choice prevents us from collecting long-term outcome data, we believe that it is necessary from an ethical point of view to correct any misinformation provided. We discuss our approach to debriefing participants in detail in Ethics Appendix B, where we also provide all information, consent, and debriefing documents. Both experiments received full ethics review and were approved by our institution's Research Ethics Committee under references 1050 and 92361. Main factors in the experiment. In both experiments, we use a factorial design, a 2x design in the Australian case, and a 3x design in the British case. The first factor varies the content that is broadcast. In the Australian case, we vary whether participants are exposed to the unchallenged interview with the extreme right activist or to a weather report, and in the British case, we replicate the first two categories and add a third one, a version of the interview, where the extreme right actor is challenged by the interviewer. This addition allows us to test the effect of the interviewer's strategy on extreme right beliefs and norms. While we use the exact same segments for the two groups that listen to the unchallenged and challenged interview in the British case, those in the challenged interview group also hear the journalists' responses and criticism of Robinson's claims. We use a weather report as the placebo condition because we assume the content to be neutral compared to the interview. The second experimental factor is the same across both experiments. A presenter announces at the start and the end of the segment that the interview is was either broadcast on Sky News or on the presenter's YouTube channel. An Australian and a British native speaker were recruited to announce the platform on which the interview and weather report were allegedly broadcast at the start and the end of the audio clip. 
These additions to the clip were meant to ensure that subjects understood the platform on which the interview or weather report was broadcast. Regarding the platform, even though some people may use YouTube as their main source of information, we consider YouTube to be less heavily regulated, and hence more likely to platform extreme content, especially on the extreme right. Indeed, YouTube is a space where extremism, hate speech and hostility are not uncommon. It is popular among right-leaning users and studies have shown that YouTube is an attractive platform for people and organizations with extreme right views to recruit, organize and radicalize others. YouTube's recommendation system also enables extreme right channels to be discovered. The Australian recordings last between 1.40 placebo to 2.30 minutes and the British recordings last between 1.30 placebo to 2.30 minutes. We display the factorial design of the experiments in Table 1 below. To ensure that respondents complied with the treatments, respondents could not skip through the respective segments. They had to listen to them in full. In both countries, dropout rates are not significantly different across experimental groups. They range from 85 to 126 dropouts in the Australian case and from 146 to 154 dropouts in the British case. Data collection and outcome measurement. We fielded the experiments on nationally representative samples of the Australian and British adult populations, N equals 5062 in Australia and N equals 5482 in the UK. Both experiments were administered by the high-quality survey firm Servation. The Australian experiment was administered over two rounds between 1 to 9 December 2020 and 2 to 9 March 2022, and the British experiment was fielded from the 21st of July to 1 August 2022.10. This resulted in around 1,250 respondents per group in the Australian case and 950 respondents in the British case. To test our hypotheses, the post-treatment surveys included multiple items measuring extreme right attitudes, four items in the Australian experiment and five items in the British one, extreme right norms, four items in the Australian experiment and five items in the British one, and the respectability of the actors, one item per survey. Concerning extreme right attitudes, we asked respondents how much they agreed with each extreme right statement mentioned by the extreme right actor in the interview. We adapted the statements based on what each actor was talking about. Cottrell talked a lot about immigration and criminality, while Robinson focused more on terrorism and Islam. All items are highly correlated so we take the mean of the items and reweight the single item on a scale ranging from 0 to 1. One means that respondents fully agree with Cottrell's Robinson's views. We present the results with the attitudinal scale in the main analysis, but results are comparable for each item, as shown in tables E and E in the appendix. The variable on extreme right norms relates to items that asked respondents to rate the percentage of Australians British that agree with each of Cottrell's Robinson's extreme right statements. This variable refers to descriptive norms that capture people's perception of how society actually thinks about these statements. This variable, which has been traditionally used to measure social norms in existing studies, differs from individual attitudes and how an individual thinks about these claims. Since all items are also highly correlated, we take the mean of the items and reweight the single item on a scale ranging from 0 to 1, one means that respondents think 100% of Australians British agree with Cottrell's Robinson's views. We show the results of the scale in the main body, but findings are similar for each item, see tables E and E in the appendix. Our last outcome variable asked respondents how respectable they think the extreme actor is on a five-point scale. The question, which is the same in the Australian and the British experiments, is recoded into a categorical variable because there is some differential attrition as a function of the treatment, where respondents are less likely to answer don't know in the interview conditions, see table F. In the appendix, those who do not find the actor respectable take value 0, those who find him respectable take value 1 and those who don't know take value 2. We then analyze this question using multinomial logistic regressions. 
We deviate from the pre-analysis plan as excluding don't knows from this question could introduce bias into our estimates. We discuss this change and other minor changes to the pre-analysis plan in Appendix C. Recorded pre-treatment covariates include gender, age, region, education, political ideology, authoritarian libertarian attitudes, and vote in the 2019 general election. We also add a question in the British survey on whether respondents voted leave or remain in the European Union in the 2016 referendum. Our treatment effects are estimated using OLS regression models with HC standard errors when we regress the attitudinal norms outcome on the experimental conditions. We deviate from our pre-analysis plan concerning the respectability question and use a multinomial logit regression in this case. We test all predictions in country-specific models without and with covariate adjustment. Results are consistent throughout and do not depend on model specifications. Additionally, we present our results with the full sample because our manipulation checks were successful, see Table F. While both survey experiments are very well-powered and similar in substance, we made a few additions in the UK experiment, where we included additional manipulation and attention checks, and randomized the order of the outcome variables. We also added two secondary outcome variables in the British study. For more information on the changes that were made and the power analyses, see our pre-analysis plan of the British experiment. The questionnaires of the Australian and British experiments are displayed in Appendix Documents A and A Results. Interview effects on agreement with extreme right statements. Table 2 displays the results of platforming the extreme right actor on individual support for extreme right attitudes in Australia, models 1 to 4, and the United Kingdom, UK, models 5 to 8. We find that respondents who listen to the unchallenged interview, as opposed to those who listen to the weather report, are more likely to conform to the actor's extreme right attitudes in both countries, regardless of the platform that is invoked. The effects are highly statistically significant across the board, at p less than 0.001 significance level, comparable across the two countries and remain similar when we adjust for pretreatment covariates. According to Cohen's criteria, this effect is small to medium in terms of size, D equals 0.16 standard deviations for Australia and D equals 0.18 for the UK. This effect is nonetheless substantive in this context as it means that the exposure prime in the unchallenged interview, compared to listening to the weather report, caused a 3 to 5% points increase in individuals' support for the actor's extreme right positions voiced in the interview. This is substantively important given that the actor's claims are extreme. Nonetheless, a large minority of Australians appear to agree with them. The direction and size of the effects are also comparable to those found in existing field and survey experiments that show the persuasive effects of media or campaign messages. Figure 1 displays bar charts including the mean level of agreement with the extreme right actor's statements, scaled to range from 0 to 1, for each experimental group and 95% confidence intervals. In line with the persuasion and normalization hypothesis, unchallenged interviews shift participants' attitudes further to the right. What is striking is that the base level of agreement with these statements does not seem to matter much. While more Australians agree with the statements in the placebo condition than Brits, around one-third of the population, effect sizes are comparable. Table 2 provides further information on the conditions under which respondents may be more or less supportive of the extreme right claims expressed by the actor. First, we do not find that the type of platform conditions the way media interviews affect respondents' positions on extreme right views. The effect of the type of platform, as well as the interaction between the interview and the platform, are small and non-significant across the board and in the two countries. Listening to the unchallenged interview on the YouTube channel may slightly increase the support towards extreme right attitudes as opposed to those who listen to the interview on Sky News, as Figure 1 suggests, but the difference is minimal and not significant. Although this finding goes against our expectations on the type of platform, it corroborates Peterson and All Among S study that shows that, conditional on exposure, unfamiliar news sources are as effective at shifting public opinion as familiar. Media with established reputations. 
Additionally, we find that if the journalist challenges the extreme right activist, updating, effects of the extreme right interview do not materialize. Indeed, Table 2 and Figure 1 show that British respondents who listen to the challenged interview are no more inclined to agree with extreme right positions than those who listen to the weather report, as the effect is non-dash, significant and equal to zero in models 5 to 8. Moreover, the effect of the challenged interview is significantly different from the effect of the unchallenged interview, table 2. This means that the journalist's critical questioning balances the effect of the extreme right activists. Words. As in line with our pre-registered expectations, the effect of the interview on support. For extreme right views is larger if the extreme right actor is not challenged by the journalist. Interview effects on descriptive norms. We now check if exposure to an extreme right interview affect people's perceptions of descriptive norms as they relate to extreme right statements. Table 3 and Figure 2 replicate the analyses on attitudes, but with a different dependent variable that asks respondents about the proportion of Australians British they think agree with the statements. We find that respondents who listen to the unchallenged interview are more likely to think that society agrees more with these extreme right views than those who listen to the weather report, regardless of the platform. The effects are statistically significant at the 0.001 level in both countries. Listening to the unchallenged interview increases people's belief that society has moved in favour of these extreme right views by 2-3% points in Australia and by 6% points in the UK, as opposed to listening to the weather forecast. These effects translate into small to medium size effects in both countries, D equals 0.16 in Australia and D equals 0.22 in the UK, and are thus comparable in size to the effects we found on individuals' approval of extreme right statements. Moreover, in the Australian case, the effect on normalisation is only significantly different from zero on the Sky News platform, although the interaction between the platform and the interview is not statistically significant. There is no suggestive evidence of an interaction between platform and interview in the British case. Overall, we do not find that descriptive norms are affected by the platform on which the interview was reported. Listening to the interview where a message is queuing a traditional mainstream platform as opposed to an alternative online platform does not increase people's beliefs that society agrees with the claims promoted by the extreme right actor. In line with our expectations, listening to the challenged interview attenuates the normalization effect, but does not entirely reverse it. As shown in Table 2, the normalization effect declines from 6% points to 2% points in substantive terms but a 2% point increase is still significantly different from zero at the 0.05 level. Therefore, the unchallenged interview still causes a 2% point increase over a baseline of 34% in people's belief that society agrees with these extreme right views. This means that being exposed to an interview where the journalist adopts a confrontational stance towards the claims of the extreme right actor, as opposed to listening to a weather report, while not shifting attitudes, contributes to the normalization of extreme right views. Still, the effect is significantly smaller compared to those who listen to the unchallenged interview where the interviewer adopts an accommoda. Tive media strategy, while challenging the extreme right actors' claims is more effective than not challenging them at all, it does not fully reverse the normalization process. 12 Indeed, when we compare the challenged and unchallenged interview groups only, we find that those who listen to the challenged interview, especially those who listen to the interview on the YouTube channel, think that a smaller percentage of people agree with extreme right views, as opposed to those who listen to the unchallenged interview, see Figure 2 and Table F in the appendix. Interview effects on the respectability of the extreme right actor. Finally, we look at how platforming extreme right views affects the perceived level of respectability of the actor who expresses these views. We display the results in Figure 3. The results show some differences by country. 
While we observe large and statistically significant negative net effects on perceived respectability in the UK on both platforms and both interview conditions, findings are more mixed in Australia. There is both an increase in respondents who see Cottrell as respectable and as unrespectable in the treatment conditions. We also model this answer situation using multinomial logistic regression because don't knows are more prevalent in the placebo condition, the weather report, and excluding them would bias our results. The results, which are displayed in Table E in the appendix, confirm a positive effect on perceived respectability vs don't knows and between perceived unrespectability vs don't knows. The difference between these two options is relatively equal given that the level of net respectability is already slightly higher in the control groups, the weather report. These contrasting findings by country could be explained by the way the two actors are initially perceived in the placebo. The placebo groups in figure 3 reveal that Robinson was considerably more well-known than Cottrell initially, and a higher number of individuals held negative views of him compared to positive ones. In contrast, Cottrell was an unknown figure. This suggests that giving a platform to unknown extreme right actors might lead to polarized opinions, while it might backfire on those who have already a relatively high level of notoriety. Interestingly, we find some evidence from the Australian case that the platform negatively affects the level of respectability of the actor. We do not find any evidence for such a mechanism in the UK. As shown in column 2 of table E and in figure 3, the level of respectability, unrespectability, towards Cottrell is lower, higher, among those who listen to the unchallenged interview on Sky News as opposed to those who listen to the unchallenged interview on the YouTube channel. This means that the reputation of the Australian extreme right actor is more tarnished when the interview is on a traditional mainstream. Platform. Yet, while this effect is in the same direction in the UK, it is not statistically significant. We can therefore conclude that there is mixed evidence on whether the type of platform affects the image of the actor. Last but not least, Table E and Figure 3 show that adopting a confrontational interview strategy negatively affects the image of the extreme right actor. This is consistent with our findings for extreme right attitudes and norms. British respondents who are assigned to the challenged interview are about 9% points less inclined to find Robinson respectable compared to those who listen to the unchallenged interview, which corroborates our media strategy hypothesis. The negative effect of the interview on the respectability of the extreme right actor is larger if the extreme right actor is challenged by the journalist. Manipulation, attrition, and attention checks. We report a series of manipulation, attrition, and attention checks in Appendix F. First, as expressed earlier, the manipulation checks were successful, which means that the cues were well understood by respondents. As Table F shows, a large majority of participants were able to identify the type of content and platform they listened to. Second, we made sure that our results are not affected by potential differential attrition across experimental conditions. Since respondents had the opportunity to answer don't know to any of the questions, we had to check that there was no differential attrition as a function of the experimental condition to which respondents were assigned to. As shown in Table F, we found no differential attrition for extreme right attitudes or descriptive norms, but we found some differences across conditions for the level of respectability of the actor. We therefore used multinomial logit models and included don't knows as a separate category for this dependent variable. Third, our findings are robust to the exclusion of respondents who did not pass the pretreatment attention check, see tables FF and F in the appendix. There is one exception in the interaction between the unchallenged interview and the Sky News platform. Concerning individuals' support for extreme right attitudes, this result goes in the same direction as in the main analysis but is significant at p. Contrary to the hypothesized direction of the interaction, see Model 8 of Table F. Since it is only a small minority of respondents who fail the check, 12.59% in Australia and 17.86% in the UK, we presented our main findings with all respondents. Finally, we are confident in our null findings relating to the type of platform because Sky News was ranked as more mainstream and trustworthy than the YouTube channel by respondents in both countries. 
Moreover, Sky News was perceived as mainstream and trustworthy as the two other popular channels in each respective country, ABC for Australia and the BBC for the UK. Two paired t-tests, see table F in the appendix, also confirm that Sky News was perceived as more mainstream and trustworthy than the YouTube channel and the difference is statistically significant at p less than 0.001 in both countries. Additionally, we run the models where we only include respondents who ranked Sky News as a mainstream platform. The models, which are found in table in the appendix, shows consistent results with the main models, thereby suggesting that our findings hold for the majority of respondents who consider Sky News to be a mainstream platform. Mechanisms While we have established that the media platforming of extreme right activists influences individual support for extreme right statements and their perception of others' endorsement of these statements, we found that the type of platform, YouTube or Sky News, on which the interview was allegedly broadcast does not impact respondents' attitudes or beliefs. In line with our theory and hypotheses, the most credible explanation for these findings is that respondents update their views in the direction of the information that they receive, even if that information is extreme and, at least partially, incorrect. In Table 4 we provide evidence on potential mechanisms that might explain some of these findings. In line with an explanation based on updating, we find that British Respon- Dents are not only more likely to agree with extreme right statements in the unchallenged condition, but they are also more likely to believe that these statements are accurate after exposure. Moreover, once challenged by the interviewer, Table 4 shows that respondents are significantly less likely to rate these statements as accurate and hence do not approve of them. This finding highlights the role that fact-checking can play in correcting extreme right. Statements, which is consistent with existing studies, Chan et al., 2017, Wood and Porter, 2019. While we cannot statistically identify the causal chain that connects beliefs in the factual accuracy of a statement and agreement with that statement, the evidence is at least consistent with such a mechanism. There are possible alternative interpretations of our findings that we need to address. First and foremost, the interviews might have failed to convey that the activists interviewed are extreme or far-right activists, or perhaps this information was only conveyed in the challenged interview condition and not in the unchallenged interview condition. Such an explanation might appear plausible, given the relatively high levels of agreement, one-third in the UK and just below 50% in Australia, with the actors' statements in the placebo conditions. We find very strong evidence against an interpretation that questions whether subjects were able to infer the true nature of the actor or his statements. Table 4 clearly shows that an overwhelming majority of subjects is able to correctly identify the interviewee as a far-right activist. We find that respondents who listen to the interview are much more inclined to believe that Robinson is a far-right political figure, as opposed to those who listen to the weather report. The effect amounts to almost 60% points. The unchallenged interview alone makes his extreme right ideology apparent. In fact, as Table 4 shows, the challenged interview adds little to how respondents categorize the interviewee. Next, we test whether subjects update their attitudes across the board, or if there is significant heterogeneity based on socially conservative pretreatment attitudes. The latter would suggest that only those already predisposed to conform to extreme right statements would eventually do so. Explanations focused on backlash and polarization would also suggest that socially liberal individuals should be less likely to agree with the statements made after exposure. However, in our pre-registered test for heterogeneous treatment effects by liberal authoritarian attitudes, we find only weak evidence in favor of such a mechanism and no evidence of backlash. Figure 4 displays the conditional average treatment effects of the unchallenged interview conditional on liberal authoritarian attitudes, ranging from liberal 0 to 1 authoritarian, that we recorded based on agreement with multiple unrelated statements before the treatment. While the positive effect of the interview appears stronger among those with medium to high authoritarian attitudes, the interaction is not statistically different from 0 and the effect is not negative among liberal respondents. In fact, what is clearly visible from these figures 
is just how prevalent authoritarian social attitudes are in both countries, although they are even more pronounced in Australia. In Appendix Table F, we showed that respondents rate Sky News as significantly more mainstream and trustworthy than a YouTube channel. In Figure 5, we display the conditional average treatment effects of the type of platform by age. It might be possible that older respondents are more likely to perceive platform effects than younger respondents who are more familiar with online media. While we find some evidence in favour of that in Australia, we find no evidence of such an explanation in the UK. Platform effects are zero in the UK across all ages. Conclusion. Does the platforming of extreme right actors contribute to the spread and normalisation of extreme right views? And if so, how? Using two large survey experiments based on real-life interviews with extreme right political activists in Australia and the UK, we consistently find that giving a platform, no matter the type or style, to an extreme right activist leads to a change in perceived descriptive norms. Our study also suggests that uncritical interviewing leads individuals to agree with the statements made by the actor. Our findings on belief accuracy is consistent with a mechanism suggesting that people become persuaded of the accuracy of these views if they go unchallenged. However, the type of platform on which the extreme right actor diffuses his ideas does not appear to matter per se. Being exposed to an extreme right interview on a traditional mainstream TV channels or on the online platform YouTube has the same effect on attitudes and norms. Drawing on the UK experiment, we also show the relevance of a journalist's critical stance towards the actor and his statements. Individuals are more likely to agree with extreme right statements and think that others agree with them if the actor's extreme and false claims are not challenged by the journalist. Having a journalist challenge the actor's ideas counteracts the attitudinal effects that we observe in the unchallenged interview and has a large negative effect on how accurate people rate his statements. However, we find zero evidence that adverse interviewing makes people less likely to agree with extreme right statements compared to the placebo group. This is an important finding, which speaks directly to the popular claim that critical exposure damages extreme right ideas. It seems to have a negative impact on the actor, as respondents exposed to the adverse interview rate him as less credible. However, it does not appear to defeat extreme right ideas, only fight them to a draw. Moreover, while adverse interviewing attenuates the normalization of extreme right views in society, these normalization effects do not entirely disappear, but appear to materialize at a lower rate. Platforming extreme right actors hence leads to a smaller change in descriptive norms, which cannot entirely be mitigated by adverse interviewing. Finally, we find that exposure is not costless for extreme right actors, at least not in all contexts. While their name recognition increases overall, the image of the extreme right activist is consistently tarnished in the British experiment, with negative ratings increasing more than positive ratings after exposure. This is not the case in the Australian experiment, where both positive and negative ratings increase in tandem. This study contributes to the literature on the support for the far right by providing evidence for the attitudinal and normalisation effects of media exposure to extreme right actors and messages via interview formats. Individuals appear to update their attitudes in the ideological direction of the message, which is consistent with more general findings from survey experiments. However, it is striking that updating in the direction of the information still occurs even when strong source cues related to extreme right content are present and perceived by respondents. Clearly, a large majority of participants were able to identify the interviewee as being part of the extreme right using only the statements made, without relying on the challenging questions and contextualization provided by the interviewer. People are not only more likely to agree with extreme right statements after interview exposure, but are also more likely to believe that such statements are accurate. This goes against the backlash and polarization hypotheses, which would predict that people's attitudes move against the extreme right after exposure or in opposite directions based on their ideological priors, leading to polarization. This is not the case. Exposure to extreme right actors moves people towards the extreme right, not against it. It also does not appear to polarize their views, at least not to a large extent. 
Where we do observe some polarization is in the case of the actor's image, but we cannot predict this polarization based on prior attitudes. Our findings also suggest that the type of platform where the interview is broadcast does not influence people's views or their perceptions of how popular those views are in. Society at large. While this might contradict some studies that emphasize the importance of source cues in making messages more effective, our results resonate with Peterson and All Among Us' recent experimental study, which finds that unfamiliar media sources, i.e. with no pre-existing reputation, influence opinion as much as familiar media sources. Moreover, by conducting realistic and credible experiments in Australia and the UK, we complement studies of media, non, exposure that primarily focus on the United States. Our experiments combine a high degree of internal validity with environmental and external validity by using real-life interviews and reaching similar conclusions in both Australia and the UK. At the expense of not being able to detect if these attitudinal and normalization effects are durable, we can show that persuasion and normalization effects are consistent in two countries with varying shares of conservative media. Interviews with extreme right actors shift people's views to the extreme right in environments where people are exposed to two-thirds of conservative media, like in Australia, or only one-third, like in the UK. Our findings are likely to generalize to a large set of extreme right issues, as we observe similar results in both interviews across topics related to immigration, crime, terrorism and Islam. They should also hold across most industrialized countries, where extreme right activists are an increasing presence in the media, whether it's Alex Jones on Infowars in the US or Eric Zemmer in Le Figaro in France. Additionally, as conservative media outlets and platforms such as Fox News or GB News, along with talk radio or podcasts such as the Salem Radio Network or The Daily Wire, have gained popularity, more and more people are likely to be exposed to such interviews. This study also makes important contributions to the emerging literature on the normalization of the extreme right. While often assumed, but rarely tested, we have demonstrated that media platforming of extreme right actors contributes to the acceptance of extreme right attitudes. In society, we employed descriptive norms as an outcome variable, a rarely utilized approach in political science, to show that exposure to extreme right interviews in the media also prompts individuals to revise their perception of others' agreement with those statements. This finding is significant as others have shown that individuals rely on descriptive norms to shape their own behavior. If they give extreme right actors a platform to air their views, media channels contribute to normalizing hatred against minority groups, thus undermining the values and norms of liberal democracy. Further research on normalization of far-right views should include the role of the media as a significant factor that can influence increased public expressions of support for the far-right. Additionally, this study has focused on the extreme right, but further studies could investigate the effects of media platforming of views articulated by extreme left-wing actors. Based on our results, we have no reason to believe that attitudinal and normative updating would not happen in the same way. Finally, our findings align with recent studies that demonstrate how negative media portrayal of Muslims increase negative sentiment towards them and fuels support for anti-Muslim policies. Moreover, we provide evidence that increased media exposure to derogatory speech drives anti-outgroup attitudes and that these negative effects are comparable for different perceived outgroups, such as black Africans in Australia and Muslims and refugees in the UK. This is particularly concerning given the increased media coverage of Muslims and refugee stories over time. Oh, your study has significant implications for politicians, policymakers, and journalists. First, the finding that platforming unchallenged extreme right content radicalizes individuals and normalizes extreme views in society is sobering, especially for those who expect that extreme right views lose credibility when broadcast. Second, persuasion and normalization effects can be significantly alleviated if journalists engage with extreme right actors critically and dare to challenge them robustly. Journalists who fact-check incorrect claims nullify the effectiveness of the conveyed message on attitudes and significantly mitigate, although not nullify, the process of normalizing these views in society at large. However, importantly, 
they do not reverse the process but can, at best, hope to balance the extreme right activists' influence. As a result, our study suggests that if TV channels decide to platform extreme right activists, journalists who adopt a critical, challenging tone and question the accuracy of false statements can mitigate attitudinal and, to a lesser extent, normative effects. Third, in some contexts, critical engagement appears to negatively affect the actor's image. This means that exposure does not come without consequences for the extreme right activist. Finally, reach matters. Media platforms, whether traditional mainstream TV channels or alternative internet platforms, can serve as powerful spaces for spreading and normalizing extreme right content. The power of traditional mainstream media sources, however, appears to lie more in their ability to capture a larger audience than in any inherent difference in the effectiveness of their messages once they have gained an audience. Therefore media deplatforming still appears as an effective tool to minimize the reach of extreme right actors and hate speech, as shown by recent social media studies. In times of growing media exposure of extremist actors and content, journalists who question the accuracy of extreme right beliefs and media companies that are willing to enforce standards and a platform individuals who break them may be able to counter the empirical pattern that this study documents.